I analyzed all 27 of the Beatles' number one hit songs, and at the end of this video, you'll understand how to think like a hit songwriter to create and arrange songs that engage your listener, keep them listening, and coming back for more. John Lennon and Paul McCartney of the Beatles have written the most number one hit songs and have held that title since the 60s. What is it about the Beatles songwriting that fueled Beatlemania and what can we learn from their approach to arranging a hit song? This video is part of a series where we examine trends in popular music. We'll be measuring the structure and instrumentation of all 27 of the Beatles' number one hit songs and looking for similarities, tropes, and tells of simplistic songwriting genius. So let's get into it. Let's start with structure. What is popular song structure? The biggest part of the Beatles' impact was their careful engineering of the popular song form. Inspired by the sounds of black American rhythm and blues that had launched successful careers in Chuck Berry, T-Bone Walker, and Willie Dixon. The early performances of the Beatles were filled with covers and reimaginations of records that they'd heard from across the Atlantic. The instrumentation, groove, and harmonic choices influenced the Fab Four to take on the sounds of the American rhythm and blues to the world stage. I've made all the data and the arrangement templates available for free in the description of this video so you can get a better understanding of how these songs are constructed. Now a majority of the Beatles' number one hits contain an average of only two sections. Only a handful of their tunes follow the now traditional verse, pre-chorus, chorus popular song form. The most common pop musical form with two sections is the AABA form, a staple in the jazz and swing music popular in the 20th century American lexicon. Now this 32 bar structure is different because it presents the main hook in the A sections and uses the B section as a contrasting bridge section, the combined form being known in jazz as a chorus. A jazz standard like When You Wish Upon a Star begins with two two eight bar A sections, which function as the main section of music. They each begin with a hook and they develop in slightly different ways. Then you have an eight bar bridge that's kind of forgettable and no one really cares about, but it's super necessary to set up anticipation for the return to the chorus, the last eight bar A section. The Beatles use this exact form in three of their number one hits. Love Me Do, their first number one, the Long and Winding Road, their last number one, and Yesterday, their most covered and most recorded number one hit. So you can think of the AABA form like this. We have the first A, which introduces a section of gratification. The second A has a similar amount of gratification, but it's at risk of becoming static. So we add variation for reinforcement as well to build and develop to the B section, which is our main area of contrast. We're going to build tension and anticipation for the return to the gratification in the last A section. Because the song's main hook lives in the A section, the song form itself is 75% chorus. And that makes this form much more chorus heavy than the now traditional pop form used by all of these other hits, where the average chorus accounts for around 39% of the song. But I wonder how that number will change when we look at more modern music from the 2010s. Hmm. Up next, I'll show you three ways that you can achieve this structure in a natural and adaptable way. The first being chorus time. One of the most noticeable arrangement devices of the Beatles is their chorus start time. On average, the Beatles tune reached the first chorus in only 19 seconds, but what's really remarkable is how 40% of their hits open with the chorus directly, or they hit that hook immediately after a short intro. This is a fantastic way of building expectation for the next chorus, and it will keep your audience listening to hear that hook again. The second is tempo. How many bars do you have to play with before you need to start increasing energy and building tension through anticipation? The average tempo of a Beatles number one hit is 126 BPM. Typically, faster tempos would allow for more bars before the chorus, which is a trend that we saw in the last video on Max Martin. In the next video, we're gonna be comparing those two eras more in depth. The third method it is how many sections you choose to use in your arrangement, how much variation you want. Introducing sections of variation or contrast can help to guide the listener's expectation throughout the song. Now the Beatles limited their sections to only around three, only using four sections in eight days a week. Popular music is focused around the repeated chorus section. The other sections are used to lead into that chorus, like a verse or a pre-chorus, 
or to contrast or develop that chorus like a bridge or a post chorus. Remember that a pop song is a moment or a story frozen in time. It's not a be all end all complete story of the universe, unless you're dream theater. Up next, let's dive into the instrumentation. The key center of a song can often have its roots in the instrumentation used to compose the song, as well as the range of the singer's voice. The Beatles often used keys like C major, G major, and A major. These are accessible keys with less than four sharps. Writing in these keys will keep the music itself relatively simple and guitar and piano friendly. When you start getting into flat keys, there are less open strings available to use on the guitar. But I mean, capos are a thing, so you'll figure it out if you want to break the rules. So the majority of the Beatles chord choices centers around the four chords, one, four, five, and six. There's no surprises there. But what is interesting is there's a decent amount of other diatonic chords, as well as some secondary dominant chords and modal borrowing from minor or parallel key centers. The Beatles were not afraid to explore a new sonic texture in the bridge or even change the key completely. There is certainly a larger variety of harmonic options that have been considered by the Beatles, often using pivot chords like two fives to get to a new key in the chorus or the bridge. Here's a brief explanation. So a huge building block of harmony is the five to one cadence. The first note or chord in a key is called the root or the one or the tonic chord. It represents the most stable chord in any key. The fifth chord is called the dominant, and it wants to resolve back to the one chord. Ah, a beautiful cadence. But what if I don't want to return to the one? What if I want to go somewhere else like the three? Well, the five to one rule still works. If we think of our destination three as our one and we measure five notes away, we're going to get the root of our secondary dominant chord, B7. So now this dominant chord is resolving down to our E minor, and that's gonna provide us with a way to pivot into a new key center. But don't worry, if you get lost, you can always cycle fives until you're back home. Now this is a commonly used technique in jazz, and it was present in much of the popular music that influenced the Beatles. When we look at a tally of Beatles instrumentation, it's no surprise to see familiar instruments like the electric guitar driving most of the melody and harmony parts. 30% of their hits had a lead guitar riff, and over 70% featured rhythm electric guitar. Piano is also used to accompany a third of the time with several other keyboard textures used as well. And of course, just about every song featured harmonized vocals, usually on choruses to reinforce the main hook. Only a few songs like Yesterday built their arrangement without drums or percussion. Around 85% of Beatles hits have the usual drum and bass rhythm section. We can also see that the most popular percussion is the tambourine, commonly used in the second verse like Hey Jude, or to fill out the last chorus like in Help. While researching this video, I was asked if the music of the Beatles would be relevant in another 50 years, which I think is an interesting question. Would the recordings of the Beatles be considered bangers in 50 years? Would the compositions be relevant to inspire or be rearranged to fit the modern instrumentation aesthetic? Could you put claps and 808s to Yellow Submarine? Maybe. Can you play Come Together with huge drums and distorted downtuned guitars? Gary Clark Jr. seems to think so. So this is where the Beatles take on the structure of an arrangement can really help them to remain relevant as these Beatles tunes have set the standard in commercial popular song form that other great number one hit songwriters have borrowed from the last 60 years. It's unclear how strong Beatlemania will be for the coming generations, but it is worth mentioning that yesterday was performed by Billie Eilish and Phineas at the 2020 Oscars, 55 years after being written. The music and lyrics are an elegant and timeless longing for days gone by, a very familiar and adaptable theme. It's my goal to find out more about what makes a song instantly timeless, and I need your help. In the next episode, we'll compare the results of this video to the 23 hits of Max Martin in an effort to discover how pop music has changed over the last 60 years. I want to ask you to comment on this video. How do you think that the structure and instrumentation has shaped popular music over the last 60 years? What do you think that there is more of in modern pop songs? What do you think there is less of in modern popular music? And will anyone care about the Beatles in another 60 years? I'd love to hear your answers below. And one more. 
In my research, I found on average that modern pop songs are an entire 60 seconds longer than a Beatles era number one hit. Where would you guess the extra time goes within the song? I want you to leave a comment. Do modern pop songs have extended outros or longer bridges? The answer will be revealed in part three, the Beatles versus Max Martin, number one hit songs, a deep dive into the evolution of popular music. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel and hit that bell. If you're new, you can get my book, How to Record Anything on my website, learnaudioengineering.com. Support me on Patreon to help me make more videos. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.